In residential construction, few components are as familiar or as quietly essential as the 2x4 stud. For more than a century, this simple piece of lumber has formed the backbone of American wood-framed walls, shaping everything from modest starter homes to complex architectural designs. Its dimensions, availability, ease of handling, and long record of performance have made the 2x4 the default choice for most non-engineered wall framing. Despite its ubiquity, the way we deploy 2x4 studs is far from arbitrary. Every stud layout carries structural consequences, energy implications, cost considerations, and practical trade-offs that echo throughout the entire building. Among the most significant decisions framers and designers face is the choice between spacing studs at 16 inches on center or 24 inches on center. Both patterns appear throughout the International Residential Code, and both are widely used in the field. But they are not interchangeable. The spacing you choose influences the wall's ability to resist load and manage thermal performance. It determines material consumption, labor efficiency, and even how sheathing elements like plywood and OSB will land on the frame. In this video, we will explore that decision with clarity and precision. We will examine the code framework that governs when a 16-inch or 24-inch spacing is appropriate. Modern stud spacing did not emerge from theoretical engineering or abstract code development. The familiar 16-inch or 24-inch spacing patterns function less as a historical artifact and more as a well-calibrated practical organizing principle at the heart of modern stud wall framing. These intervals provide predictable, repeatable geometry that simplifies layout, supports uniform load distribution, and aligns perfectly with the standard sizes of modern wood structural panels. Most engineered panels, whether plywood, OSB, or gypsum board, are manufactured in four foot wide sheets which fits perfectly over framing spaced at these intervals. If studs are spaced at 16 inches on center, then a single panel will span across four studs while the same panel will perfectly span across three studs when the studs are spaced at 24 inches on center. The result is an efficient system in which framing members such as studs and sheathing work in concert allowing builders and engineers to assemble walls, floors, and roofs with consistent bearing, reliable fastening patterns, and orderly load pads. The predictable stud spacing forms a consistent nailing base for shear walls and exterior finishes which simplifies load distribution by creating uniform tributary widths. This helps to preserve the integrity of the prescriptive design process which relies heavily in standardized spacing patterns. The prescriptive design of wall studs in the International Residential Code is based on the fifth table in section R602.3 which we are going to call the stud design table. This table codifies the allowable combinations of stud size, stud height and spacing for a variety of common framing scenarios. In effect, it gives designers and builders a ready-made framework for code-compliant framing prescriptions for walls that carry standard loads under ordinary conditions. The stud design table is organized around a simple but consequential distinction, whether a wall is bearing or non-bearing. This division frames everything that follows, because the structural demands placed on a stud wall depend fundamentally on whether it supports imposed loads or merely partitions space. Bearing walls are walls that are expected to carry framing and gravity loads from the roof and upper floors. In the bearing wall section, the stud sizes, the maximum allowable wall heights and the maximum spacing are tightly coordinated. For each nominal stud dimension, the table identifies the tallest wall that can be framed under standard residential loading while remaining within prescriptive limits. These heights are provided along with their corresponding maximum spacing, typically 16 or 24 inches on center. These values capture the intersection of the wood material's capacity against compression and the overall framing characteristics that provide stability against weak axis buckling. A stud must be adequately braced by sheathing or bridging to prevent premature failure resulting from buckling within the wall cavity. 
The result is a clear, prescriptive matrix that tells builders exactly when a given stud size and spacing is acceptable for load-bearing work without the need for engineering calculations. The non-bearing wall section reflects an entirely different set of constraints. Because these walls are not required to support roof or floor loads, their allowable heights are generally greater, and spacing limits tend to be more permissive. The governing considerations are primarily serviceability concerns such as preventing excessive deflection and ensuring reliable fastening for finishes. Just like the bearing wall portion, the table lists the stud size, stud height and stud spacing combinations but with relaxed restrictions because the structural demands are much less. This contrast between the two sections reflects the underlying engineering logic that ensures the framing system maintains a coherent and reasonable balance between structural demand and available capacity. Let us look at an example to see how the stud design table defines the spacing limits for bearing walls framed with 2x4 studs. In this example, we have two buildings. Building A is a one-story wood-framed structure with exterior walls that are 9 feet tall and a total building width of 32 feet. The roof is conventionally framed and is finished with asphalt shingles. The building is located in a region with a ground snow load of 30 pounds per square foot. The roof live load is 20 pounds per square foot. The exterior walls are bearing walls supporting only a roof ceiling assembly with no additional floors or significant concentrated loads. Lateral support is provided at the top and bottom plates, giving an unsupported height that falls within the 10-foot limit prescribed by the stud design table. Building B is a two-story building with 9-foot tall exterior bearing walls and a total building width of 32 feet. The roof is conventionally framed and is finished with asphalt shingles. The building is located in a region with a ground snow load of 30 pounds per square foot. The roof live load is 20 pounds per square foot. Since building B is a two-story building, the exterior walls at the first floor support a full floor system in addition to the roof ceiling assembly above. Just like building A, the laterally unsupported stud height is 9 feet, which remains within the table's 10-foot maximum limit. For building A, the studs carry only the roof ceiling assembly. Under these conditions, the stud design table permits a stud spacing of 24 inches on center for 2 by 4 studs at the given height and loading. The axial load on each stud consists of the roof and ceiling loading in addition to the weight of the wall and the prescriptive provisions recognize that both strength and stiffness can be maintained at this wider spacing. For building B, the addition of a floor significantly increases the compressive demand on the studs. Once a wall supports one floor plus a roof and ceiling assembly, the prescriptive path tightens, and the maximum permitted spacing for 2 by 4 studs becomes 16 inches on center. This reduction reflects the need to maintain adequate capacity as gravity loads increase. If spacing wider than 16 inches were desired, the wall would need to be designed using engineered analysis rather than relying on the prescriptive table. It is important to note that the prescriptive tables are provided to accommodate a wide range of framing configurations and loading limits within the prescriptive framework of the International Residential Code. The prescriptive provisions in the International Residential Code are limited to structures in areas where the design ground snow load does not exceed 70 pounds per square foot. This means that the prescriptive tables such as the stud design table may be used to design structures in regions with ground snow loads up to 70 pounds per square foot. Additionally, the header span tables in section R602.7 allow for building widths up to 36 feet while footnote C in the stud design table limits buildings with a habitable attic assembly supported by 2 by 4 studs to a roof span limit of 32 feet. These restrictions help preserve the versatility of the prescriptive tables while ensuring they maintain the level of structural reliability required by the code. If a designer wants to go beyond these limits, then they must consult an engineer to evaluate the adequacy of the studs and the impact of exceeding these limits on other aspects of the design including foundations, the lateral force resisting system and other critical elements on the load path. 
Let us take some time to look closely at footnote C and examine its implications on the overall design framework. We have already mentioned that this footnote limits buildings with a habitable attic supported by 2x4 studs to a roof span limit of 32 feet. This means that if the designers of building A and B later decide to make the attics at these buildings habitable, they will not need to change the design of the bearing walls to accommodate the increased weight as long as the roof span limit does not exceed 32 feet. What if the roof span limits exceeds 32 feet? Let us consider buildings C and D with habitable attics and roof spans at 36 feet. For such buildings, the easiest prescriptive solution is for the designer to assume that the habitable attic is an additional story. This means that the stud framing at building C will be designed by assuming that it is a two-story building which subsequently means the 2x4 stud spacing limit will be 16 inches on center. On the other hand, if we assume that the habitable attic in building D is an additional story, we cannot use 2x4 studs under the prescriptive provisions in the stud design table. Since we cannot use 2x4 studs, we are not limited by footnote C anymore. The only fully prescriptive option is to use larger size studs such as 2x6 studs spaced at 24 inches on center as shown under the two-story building configuration. While these prescriptive solutions mean that the designer does not need to consult an engineer or architect for an engineered solution, the solutions may not be optimal. It is possible the building is in a zero to moderate snow load region and has a decent amount of interior bearing walls which means that the load at each of the first floor bearing walls is not as high as the prescriptive code anticipates. In this case, the most optimal solution is to consult a civil engineer or architect to verify the adequacy of the studs as originally intended without considering the limits in footnote C. The civil engineer or architect will then provide calculations justifying the adequacy of the studs and will stamp and sign the drawings and indicate that their design is limited to the wall framing design only. Before concluding the examples that we have discussed, it is important to recognize that the stud spacing limits established in the stud design table do not operate in isolation. Choosing 24-inch spacing instead of 16-inch spacing affects how other code provisions apply, particularly those that govern load transfer through the top plate. One of the most relevant provisions is section R602.3.3, which focuses on the alignment of roof and floor framing members with the studs that support them. R602.3.3 states that when joists, rafters, or trusses are spaced more than 16 inches on center and the supporting studs below are spaced 24 inches on center, those framing members must bear within 5 inches of the studs beneath. This requirement exists because the top plates acts as a load distributor that operates effectively within certain span and loading limits. As the spacing widens, the moment demand on the top plates increases thereby increasing the risk of failure. Therefore, the code tightens the alignment requirement to ensure loads flow predictably down to the studs without imposing bending demands at the top plates. While section R602.3.3 does provide exceptions that permit framing without the 5-inch alignment rule, the exceptions also impose additional framing requirements that may not coordinate well with the original design intent. Please watch our video on single versus double top plates where we discuss the 5-inch alignment rule and the exceptions. For many residential projects, especially those aiming for straightforward design and construction, designers avoid these complexities by simply limiting stud spacing to 16 inches on center. This tighter spacing satisfies the table for nearly all common conditions resulting in a cleaner, more intuitive load path and a simpler overall design process. While the 16-inch spacing provides more vertical strength, the 24-inch spacing has an additional advantage that does not get the recognition it deserves especially from designers and engineers. A wider spacing reduces the number of studs in a wall, which in turn reduces thermal bridging. Thermal bridging refers to the unwanted flow of heat through the wood framing members such as studs which are much less insulating than the insulation provided in the cavity between them. 
Fewer studs mean that a greater proportion of the wall area is insulated rather than framed with solid wood. This allows the thermal envelope to perform at a higher efficiency than would be the case if the wall were framed with studs at 16 inches on center. Designing studs is only one part of the design process. A wall comes alive when its studs work with the sheathing that stiffens them, the floors and roof that load them, and the foundation that anchors them. In a well-designed home, nothing stands alone. Every element is essential to the functioning of the overall structural system that guarantees stability under loads. The structural frame is not just a collection of isolated pieces but a unified system that provides continuous load path from the source to the foundations. The Residential Wood Framing Design Course at www.conventionalframing.com was developed specifically for those who are interested in starting with the basics then going beyond into the critical aspects that are essential for anyone who intends to develop a full structural system for residential buildings. This training framework brings the roof framing, wall framing, floor framing, and wall bracing together into one coherent curriculum that covers all structural design aspects in residential construction with the rigor they deserve. Instead of isolated rules, you learn the rhythm of the code and the logic behind it through state-of-the-art graphics and systematic training that takes you all the way to the development and organization of construction drawings for permit application. Please check out the roof framing module, the wall and foundation framing module, the floor and deck framing module and the wall bracing module at www.conventionalframing.com. Thanks for watching and if you found this video helpful, be sure to like, subscribe, and stay tuned for more insights into wood framing.